Welcome to Polar Bears International Tundra Connections webcasts. It's polar bear season here in um, the town of Churchill, Manitoba in Canada, and we're coming to you live from Tundra Buggy One. Right outside these windows, the Arctic wind is blowing and the polar bears are wandering. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about polar bears and the Arctic ecosystem, and our target audience is the National Wildlife Federation's Eco Schools program. So, hey everybody out there. My name is David Mizajewski, and I'm a naturalist with the National Wildlife Federation. We've got a great panel here today of Arctic wildlife uh, and, and climate change specialists. So, I'm gonna let them go down the line here and introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Hi, I'm Denver Holtz. I'm from the Owl Research Institute in Montana. I've been working on owls for about 30 years, and for the last 21 years I've been working on snowy owls in Barrow, Alaska. Hi everyone, I'm Cassie Siegel. I'm an environmental lawyer, and my job is protecting animals and the places they live, and working on solutions to global warming. Hello everyone, I'm Andy DeRoche. I'm a professor of biological sciences at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. I'm a polar bear specialist. I've been studying them around the Arctic for about the last 30 years. Great. Well, before we dive into kind of talking about the, the wildlife, I want to remind folks um, to go to the My Planet My Part website, and there you can view um, some really great video, and you can participate in the chat that's going on there. You can submit your questions. A little bit later on, we'll be answering some of your questions live on the broadcast. You can also email your questions to questions at pbbears.org, which you can see up on your screen right now. So to kick things off, um, I wanted to just start by telling you a little bit about what's going on outside these windows here. It's pretty chilly here by human standards. It's uh, around freezing right now, and um, that's why you see us all bundled up here in our parkas. But um, for the wildlife that live here, that's really not all that cold. Um, and we are in, um, in Churchill, which is on the shores of the Hudson Bay in Manitoba. And I think maybe the first thing that we can start off about is talking about the town of Churchill and what it's like to live there. And I'm going to turn it over to Cassie to tell you guys a little bit about life up here. Churchill is a small town, and in a lot of ways, it's probably like the town you live in. There's houses, and there's grocery store, post office, some restaurants and shops. But um, one thing that's special about Churchill is you can't get here by car. You can't drive here. Most people who come come by airplane or uh, by train. Uh, it gets very, very cold and dark here. Um, in the winter time and there's probably almost as many polar bears as there are people and that's one uh, it's the reason that churchill is called the polar bear capital of the world it's where most people come to see polar bears in the wild and that's actually a great way to lead into talking about the tundra buggies that that we're on right now and so denver why don't you tell the students a little bit about this tundra buggy and why we're on it well this is my first trip on a tundra buggy and uh, why we're on it is because it's the best way to access the habitat around here and it's a good way to keep us safe and minimize disturbance to the to the wildlife including the polar bears and we're about what eight feet off the ground here and we can look right down and as I'm speaking below this window here there's a polar bear sleeping that's right yeah um, the other thing that I think is uh, kind of neat is that the, you know, the animals up here ha are adapted for the cold we're gonna talk about that and that's why we're wearing these really thick parkas because we're not really adapted. We don't have big fur coats or, uh, or you know, big layers of blubber like some of the wildlife up here. So, uh, Andy, why don't you tell us a little bit about the polar bears that live here and how they fit into the bigger environment? Well, this is one of 19 populations of polar bears distribu distributed around the North Pole. Uh, polar bears are um, divided up into these different groups. This population around us right now is about 900 bears. Uh, and we estimate and monitor the different populations. And one of the big questions we've got is really how are the bears responding to, to climate change? Um, these populations um, come back to the same place. And the reason that these bears are around us here is because they come back here year after year after year. So polar bears, despite the fact that they can wander over huge areas, sort of think about like almost the size of the state of Texas, um, they can wander over these huge areas in a year uh, they come back to exactly the same places. So the bears that are around us today uh, were here last year, the year before. They were probably born not too far from here, just inland in a denning area that's associated with this. So, yeah, with that said, um, you know, tell us why these bears are here now. Maybe even give us sort of a snapshot, like a sort of a, a year in the life of a polar bear. Where are they and what are they doing and, and how's the environment affecting them? 
Well, the whole life cycle of a polar bear is tied to the existence of sea ice. And right now in the Hudson Bay, which is kind of like a big inland sea, there is no sea ice there. It's melted away. It melts away in the summer and then it reforms in the winter time, late fall. And basically the bears are on vacation when they're on land. They don't really uh, want to be on shore. And if they had their preference, they would never come on land. They would actually spend their whole life out on the sea ice. But in this part of the world, the ice melts in summer, they come ashore, but they have to bring all the energy that they have with them. And that energy source is actually seals that they've hunted and killed and consumed out on the sea ice. And basically they store them in these huge fat uh, deposits on their own body. So it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. We, we always talk about the survival of the fittest. When it comes to polar bears, it's actually survival of the fattest. <laughs> well, and you know, talk a little bit about that too, about how important fat is in the diets of polar bears. And you might want to share your Oreo. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'm not going to share my Oreo cookie, but I can show you the analogy. Um, but when a, when a polar bear catches uh, a seal, and there's two species that they hunt, it's ring seals and bearded seals. We're looking at a ring seal right now. They're called ring seals because they've got those nice round rings on their fur. Uh, bearded seals are the other species. That's kind of the big meal deal. Uh, a, a ring seal would be about twice my body size. Uh, ring seals a bit less than my size. So when they catch these seals, what they do is they really want to eat the blubber layer that's just under the skin. So when they, they catch them, they basically peel them open, sort of like, think like a cookie, you kind of, you know, like an Oreo, you take off the chocolate bits and you just scoop out the icing. Well, polar bears are doing almost the same thing with a uh, seal and they just really want to eat that fat layer. Uh, and it, it's, it's because they basically take that fat uh, and they can eat up to 20% of their body weight in a single meal. And they just turn that, that seal fat into their own body fat. And they just, it just basically goes into their stomach and goes into the bloodstream and straight into their own fat cells. So that's what makes it work for a polar bear. It's, it's basically fat is where it's at if you're a bear. And, and why is that? Why is being, um, having a lot of fat on your body for a polar bear so important? Well, it's kind of neat because it, it's the energy source that they need to survive this period of time when they're on land. There's no food here on land for them to eat here. They can eat a few small berries and some seaweed and things and they'll, they'll eat anything they can find, but there's not enough energy. So they have to bring that energy with them. And so it's that whole idea that uh, basically your survival and reproduction, <coughs> because pregnant females are gonna go eight months without eating anything. They have to bring all that energy from the, basically the marine environment from the ocean from eating seals with them when they come on shore so it, it's kind of interesting because no no polar bear ever looked in a mirror and said i'm too fat I mean, <laughs> it just doesn't happen they just keep eating and eating and eating because you never know when you're going to find your next meal if you're a polar bear great um well let's talk a little bit about snowy owls and i'm going to turn it over to denver this is another arctic species and um, tell us about how they fit into this arctic ecosystem and how they make their living well, very similar to polar bears, it's just another habitat and snowy owls nest on the ground up in the Arctic tundra. And so their whole lifestyle is pretty much tied into small rodents called lemmings. And so when lemmings have a productive year, then snowy owls will have a productive year. And if you think of a lemming, it's probably something familiar, like a hamster might be a good analogy for you. And there's a picture of a lemming right there. So snowy owls nest in the ground, high up in the Arctic tundra. And their whole life cycle up there for the breeding season is determined by the lemmings. Whatever affects the lemmings affects the snowy owls. Can you tell the, the students, um, wh what is the tundra and why do the owls there have to nest on the ground? Well, the tundra is basically a treeless area. Even though we have small trees, they're very, very small, what we call prostrate, so they're flat on the ground there. And this is a good picture of the tundra here. So snowy owls don't have the option of nesting in trees like their ancestor, the great horned owl, which nests in trees in the United States and Canada and forests. So what they do is they go up to the tundra and they look for tall mounds to nest on. And what we, there you go, there's a mound right there. And what we have to do is go out there and measure the mounds, try to get characteristics what of is, what type of mound the owls like to nest on. What is that owl doing in that picture to the researcher? That owl right there is attacking the researcher. <laughs> and so I have the green jacket on and my friend has the brown jacket on. And we are at a nest uh, banding young because we want to be able to monitor their survival and their life over time. In order to do that, we have to go to the nests, and depending on the male or the female or both, uh, sometimes they can attack you and try to drive you off, and they very often hit you in the head, hit you in the ear, hit you in the bum, etc. <laughs> what does that feel like? Uh, it, 
it makes you say, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when you stick it through your butt there, right. um, you can make little holes and, and it hurts. <laughs> so uh, don't mess with an owl on the nest is the message there, yeah, unless you're a scientist. Um, Cassie, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the other wildlife that we've been seeing? Um, I know that you've seen some pretty cool foxes up here. The fox is one of my favorite animals, and we've had an amazing couple of days for watching foxes. There's two species here, and yesterday morning, after we had our breakfast, we got to see the Arctic fox. Uh, this little guy you're seeing up here on the screen now came by and pounced and caught a vole for his breakfast. It's really neat. Can you tell them what a vole is? Well, a vole is a small uh, mammal that's quite common up here. Think of it as a big fat mouse. Mm -hmm. And um, the Arctic fox is so well adapted to live in this cold northern environment in the wintertime. They put on that big white furry coat, have a big fluffy tail to keep their nose warm, furry feet, very, very small ears um, to conserve energy. And it does actually get quite warm here in the summertime. So in the summer, the Arctic fox actually loses that heavy white coat and has a much lighter uh, brown or even, even grayish coat. So, so, so um, well adapted for this really cold, extreme um, northern environment. Great. So um, there's a few questions coming in that I think I'm going to um, throw over to Andy because they're, they're getting at some of the next things I wanted to talk about. And that is... Uh, the sea ice and the polar bears relationship to it and um, the fact that polar bears really need cold environments and I'll just tell you some of the questions here that you could maybe weave in. Nick from Bear Creek Elementary wants to know will polar bears die if it's not cold enough and Sam in grade six wants to know how come polar bears don't get sick when they swim out in the frozen and icy wet weather like the way that a human being would? Okay well Nick and Sam great questions. Um, the only places in the world where we have polar bears are places that are cold enough to have the ocean freeze and the ocean has to freeze for long periods of time uh, throughout the year and if it does if we don't get enough sea ice then basically the bears uh, disappear and one of the concerns we have is as the planet warms the sea ice in the southern parts of their distribution uh, will disappear and the bears uh, will disappear as well so that's a real concern now in terms of bear swimming polar bears are really good at swimming but when they're out on the sea ice, they don't really like to swim. If they can avoid it, they will. Uh, they really want to walk on top of the ice because it's the platform that they use to hunt their prey, which are ring seals and bearded seals. So they like to walk on the ice. If they have to, they'll go in the water. Uh, but for instance, uh, in, in the springtime, when mothers with cubs are coming out of their dens, They'll walk for miles and miles and miles to keep their small cubs out of the water. Uh, small cubs, which are, you, you sort of think they're sort of like this size, um, they're very vulnerable to uh, what's called hypothermia, which means low body temperature. And they just cool down, just like if you fall into a lake in the wintertime, if it's really cold, you'll die of hypothermia uh, or you'll drown. The same thing can happen to polar bear cubs. But a big fat adult male will have no problems entering cold water because they've got this nice layer of fur that uh, keeps some of the water from getting to their skin. So it actually, the water doesn't go right up against their skin. It's actually kind of trapped on the outside. Um, they have a thick layer of blubber on their bodies and they're also really big. So those are three key elements for keeping warm. Uh, and it's just like if you're going to go into cold water, you could wear a diving suit. Well, polar bears have a built-in diving suit. Right. So, Andy, you mentioned uh, global warming, climate change. I think, Cassie, maybe can you just explain to the students what exactly that is? Sure. As we are putting more greenhouse gases out into the atmosphere, it's causing the uh, planet to warm up because those greenhouse gases trap heat that would otherwise um, go back out into space. Imagine if you're in bed and you add a blanket and then you add another blanket and another, uh, you keep heating up, we're giving the planet a fever. And the Arctic is actually impacted um, uh, earlier than some other places on the planet. It's warming about twice the rate of um, the rest of the Earth 
and as it warms up here in the Arctic, the sea ice is melting. So in the summertime, we lose more sea ice uh, each summer. This is the minimum summer sea ice in 1979. You can see Alaska and Canada on there. This is in 2007. We lost over a million square miles of sea ice. And then this year, 2012, we hit a new minimum um, sea ice extent, even lower than 2007. It's melting very quickly here in western Hudson Bay, where um, the bears need to come ashore each summer anyway. That sea ice season is getting longer. And um, this warming and melting impacts the bears in many, many ways. Yeah, and Andy, why don't you pick up there, you know, as Cassie just explained, the sea ice is, is going away. And so what does that mean for polar bears? Well, it's, it's a real problem in this part of the world because while polar bears are adapted, very well adapted to going for long periods of time without food, you can only push an animal so far. And that's the problem we've got here is the ice is melting earlier in the springtime. So we're taking the bears away from their sea ice home and their food. And then we're putting them on land for longer and longer periods of time and that really means that they have to bring more energy with them but they're actually having less opportunities to store fat and that's the real problem that we've got for for polar bears the other thing that's happening is the ice isn't forming in the fall and winter as often so when i first started coming up here about 30 years ago the bears were already leaving and we probably won't see these bears leave for at least another couple of weeks so you have to think about it, um, they're just going to run out of energy. Just like a car can only go so far with the tank of gas, the polar bears only have so much energy in their tank, which is their fat stores, and when they run out of energy, that's the end of the line for them. Yeah. Denver, how about snowy owls? Um, are there any? Are we seeing any impact from, from a warming world on those species? Oh well, yeah, I mean climate change is occurring everywhere and affecting habitats everywhere. As Cassie said, it's really sped up in the Arctic region. And so as you have the ecosystem out there in the ice, we also have the land-based ecosystem, which is being affected. And what we're seeing now is we're seeing changes in the amount of snow and the quality of snow. And as the snow quality and quantity changes, it affects lemmings. Now lemmings are the, prime, or the primary source of food for the snowy owls in many regions. Lemmings are northern animals. They need snow. They're like polar bears that need ice. They need snow and they need a lot of snow in order to breed in the wintertime and create these high fluctuations that we call cycles from time to time. So changing weather patterns is affecting snow quality and we're starting to see it's affecting lemmings, the food of snowy owls, and then it's also affecting snowy owls perhaps in the future here. Some data indicates that snowy owl numbers are going down and other species that are tied into lemmings, their numbers are going down because of the quality of snow changing due to climate changes. And can you just explain a little bit more about how, what is the relationship between lemmings and snow? How do they actually use the snow in order to survive? All right. Lemmings, again, a small rodent, maybe like a hamster. And what they need in the wintertime is they need a lot of snow. What the snow does is it creates what we call a subnivian world. So it's a little space in between the, the ground and the snow where the lemmings can live. And the lemmings can live and feed and breed under the ground, so have young, if they have the right amount of snow. It also gives them some protection from predators such as weasels, for example, although some can go into the snow and hunt them. By reducing the quantity and the quality of the snow, that exposes the lemmings to not only predation, but also it exposes them to the environment because they don't want to be cold and wet, for example, uh, just like maybe the polar bear or the Arctic fox doesn't want to get in the water and be wet. So the quality and the quantity of snow definitely will affect the lemmings, and the lemmings need it in order to breed because they spend maybe eight, ten months a year under the snow. Which leads me to my next question. How on earth then do the snowy owls find them to eat if they're buried under the snow? No one knows the answer to that question yet, okay? <laughs> we, we do think that snowy owls that wander around in the wintertime, they can come to areas and they can look out over the tundra that's around us here and somehow assess if lemmings are abundant or not abundant and make decisions rather quickly whether to keep going and go from Alaska to Russia or to Canada or to stay and breed but no one knows how they do it but one thing we know is they don't seem to miss it when the lemming numbers are really up or very high the snowy owls are there when the lemming numbers are low the snowy owls are gone and that's what we're seeing from a couple studies is that when the lemmings have disappeared due to the change in snow that the owls are disappearing, the weasels are disappearing, the foxes are having to make some adjustments, etc. So you know what this means? It means 
What do they eat? <laughs> well, what I was going to say is that it means that some of the students that are watching right now have a task. You know, some of you guys who are studying science maybe can be the ones who go into research in the future and figure out the answer to that question. Um, so, enough. Yeah. So talk a little bit about owls hearing, though, because they have a pretty phenomenal sense of hearing. It depends on the species. Hearing, vision, silent flight are all things that we, there's almost common knowledge now. That everyone seems to know about that. Uh, the snowy owl may not be the best as far as hearing goes. Your forest owls tend to be a little better, where some of them have asymmetrical ears, so one ear is higher than others. So if you guys ripped one ear off and stuck it up here and stuck the other one down here, you might look funny, but you might be able to pinpoint sounds a little bit better. A lot of forest owls have that. The snowy owl, however, is more of a vision hunter out in the Arctic. The wind's blowing all the time, so maybe they don't have to evolve keen hearing because it's so noisy, but they have to evolve keen sight. So they're more tied into being a vision hunter. Great. Let's take it back to bears. We're getting a few few more bear questions, um, and uh, I think we might be able to use some of our great props that we have here. Jay wants to know, how long are polar bears' claws? Oh, perfect question, Jay. Well, just so happens we have a couple of claws here. Um, this is a polar bear claw. This is from the front foot, um, and one of the neat things about this is it's kind of cat-like in shape, but uh, the interesting thing is, is they're not retractable. So cats can pull their claws back uh, when they're walking around. All cats except for cheetahs, which is kind of cool. But um, the idea here is that polar bears use these claws for traction. Uh, out on the sea ice, it's slippery if you're walking around. But more importantly, these sharp claws are used for grasping prey. So seals are really slippery. They don't have much to grab onto. Um, they've got very short furs, so when a polar bear comes in to catch them, they, they need to stop them from slipping back in the water. And so basically these sharp claws are incredibly pointed and they grab on and then they grab the seal with their mouth. Um, but the neat thing is, is this claw is the ancestor uh, claw, so I'll hold it up like this, that might be easier to see. This is the claw of a grizzly bear. So these claws are designed for excavation. So grizzly bears make a lot of their living uh, digging up small rodents to eat. They eat uh, ants and basically turn over rocks looking for things to eat. They spend a lot of time digging up roots um, and pulling down branches to eat berries. So when you compare these two, uh, quite a marked difference in the two claws here. Uh, see if we can get them up there. So one is really a predator's claw, and one is really uh, an excavator's claw. So quite a difference. Pretty neat. And you talked about how slippery the seals are, and the polar bears using their claws to get them um, into their mouths. We've got uh, a replica of a polar bear skull here. Why don't you tell the students a little bit about the way the skull is shaped that helps these bears survive? Well, it, it's pretty neat. We've got another slide here we'll also pull up in just a second, comparing a grizzly bear skull and a polar bear skull. but. Polar bears basically have a longer skull and a narrower skull than grizzly bears. And part of the difference is you see right at this part of the skull, sort of right at the base of the eye. So the eyes would be right here, and this is its nose, of course. Um, polar bears have a much flatter, more streamlined skull than grizzly bears. Part of it is, is when they're trying to catch their prey, which are ring seals, and these ring seals are trying to disappear down these small holes, if you've got a big round pie-shaped head, you just can't get your head down that hole. So having a narrower skull is just an advantage. And so over time, evolution has favored that skull structure. The other thing is they hunt with a sense of smell. If you have a longer part, front part of your skull, you can actually have more space in your brain to actually create the parts of your brain that are responsible for smell. And then lastly, Polar bears are active all winter, whereas all other grizzly bears, uh, ancestor, which is the ancestral polar bear, the grizzly bears are all asleep during the winter, and they don't have to deal with the extreme cold. So basically, this is a, a built-in preheating device for polar bears. And inside the nose, there's all these fine bony plates that are covered with blood vessels that pre-warm the air before it gets into your lungs. Because breathing in frigid, cold air at minus 40 degrees um, would basically cause a lot of problems for your lungs and so it pre-warms the air so perfectly adapted to this environment great well another question Hannah wants to know when polar bear cubs attack each other are they playing or are they really fighting oh well I, I guess I could ask you the same question when you're attacking your siblings at home if you have any um, 
it, it's part of a, a natural process. They do fight a lot. Um, they they don't really seem to hurt each other very often, um, and so they're they're sort of like puppies. It's part of a learning process. Uh, it helps them exercise, grow muscles, grow coordination, because they've got a large and long journey ahead of them. They're going to be with their mother for about two and a half years, and during that period of time, they're going to cover some pretty incredible distances. But Polar bear cubs, it's, it's really survival of the fittest. So if there's a weaker cub, they quite often can disappear from a litter. So we just saw a litter there that had three cubs. Uh, quite often we call those two and a half cub litters because quite often the smallest one doesn't survive. So there is a lot of competition in the wild for resources, uh, whether that's the mother's milk or a seal that's been killed by their mother. Uh, it's a tough world out there for polar bear cubs. Yeah, and I think, you know, that might sound a little sad or scary, but that's the way that nature works. And all the more reason why it's important for the mother polar bears when they're on land um, or when they're out on the sea ice to get those seal meals um, so that they can have a better chance of raising as many cubs as possible. So, you know, that brings up the issue of, of global warming and climate change again. I think it's really important to, um, to let folks know what they can do about it. Cassie, maybe can you tell everyone you know, what some of the solutions are? There are so many things that you can do um, when you're at home, when you're at school. Greenhouse pollution comes mainly from burning fuel for energy, and so saving energy is one of the top things we can do to slow global warming and help the polar bear. Things like turning out the lights when, when, you, when you leave the room using power strips so you can uh, power down the computer and other electronics and not be wasting any energy. Um, when uh, you're at school, one of the big projects um, of the uh, uh, Polar Bears International is to establish no idling zones um, at your school. So of course you want to cut down on car trips by walking or riding your bike whenever you can, but if you do need to drive, to drive um, just when you need to and then turn off the car when you're waiting to be picked up or dropped off. Not only does that save gas and cut greenhouse pollution, but it cuts down on lots of other air pollution too and makes us much healthier. If you uh, Google My Planet, My Part, you can check out Polar Bear International's website uh, where you can share ideas of what you're doing, photos of what you're doing, and get lots of other ideas about how you can help there's also even a contest going on right now where when you enter your ideas of how to cut your carbon footprint, um, you get a chance to win a trip to Churchill and see these bears in the wild. So there's um, many, many things we can do. It's a big problem. We all have to work really hard, but together um, we can solve this problem. There's still time to save polar bears, uh, but we need to work hard and, and work soon. Absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions come in, so I'll just uh, I'll give another plug, you know, for the the chat. If you guys have questions, go ahead and submit them. We're going to wrap up in just a couple minutes here. Um, I also wanted to mention another thing that you can do to get involved in cutting down the uh, the dealing with the issue of climate change and helping the wildlife, and that's sign up to become an eco school with the National Wildlife Federation. A lot of you folks out there already are uh, at schools that are participating in the program, but if you want to join, you can um, Google Eco Schools USA or just look in the chat and you'll see a link and um, then you can sign your school up as well. And I'm not seeing any more questions, so um, I think we might just want to wrap at this point. Um, we've been going on for about 30 minutes here, so um, let me just say uh, a few, uh, well, actually before I get into the end here, I also want to remind you to check out our post-broadcast survey. Um, that's going to give you a chance to tell us how this webcast was and if the information was useful and how we can do better. On your screen right now, you can see two different um, uh, web addresses there or, or survey addresses. One is for National Wildlife Federation Eco School. So if you are at an eco school, we'd love it if you filled that one out. Um, and for anybody else, and including the eco schools, you can fill out the Polar Bears International one as well. And you should be getting those links in your chat. Um, and yep, no more questions, so why don't we wrap then? I want to thank you guys for uh, participating today. I want to also give a big thank you to Julene Reed, who is an Apple Distinguished Educator and PBI Education Advisory member, um, and she directs the PBI Tundra's Connections, Connections program, which is what this is part of. Um, I also want to thank our platinum sponsor, Frontiers North Tundra Buggy Adventure. They're the folks that have brought us this great Tundra Buggy that we're sitting in today so that we can show you the polar bears that are wandering around here 
um, outside of Churchill. Support has also been provided by Pearls of the Planet, a project, a project of explore.org. Explore.org are the folks that are bringing you the great live videos that you're seeing of polar bears and other wildlife, and they're a direct charitable activity of the Annenberg Foundation. We're also grateful to Parks Canada and Tanberg, which is part of the Cisco Systems. And lastly, I want to give a big thanks to the Canada Goose folks who provided us with these parkas that have been keeping us warm. So with that, I want to thank you guys again for joining us. Hopefully you learned something about polar bears and snowy owls and all the other great wildlife that live up in the Arctic and how you guys can get, invo get involved making a difference for these animals and our planet. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye.